Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, a new vaccine gets the go-ahead for Canadians. Would the benefits outweigh the risk? And the answer to that was yes. We'll hear from the chief medical advisor who helped approve it. Also tonight, an unclassified U.S. report links the killing of a journalist to a top Saudi prince. He should be sanctioned. He should be not allowed to uh, travel. The Queen delivers an urgent message. They ought to think about other people rather than themselves. And a violent celebrity dog napping. Obviously, the perpetrators knew they came armed and prepared. The latest on Lady Gaga's response. This is The National. There is a brighter outlook tonight that you'll get your shots for COVID-19 by the fall. Health Canada's approval of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine promises to boost the country's supply. Nearly 24 million doses of AstraZeneca are set to arrive by the end of September. When you add in the two vaccines already approved, that's nearly 108 million doses, enough for just shy of 54 million people. At this point, dozens of other countries have vaccinated more people per capita. Now, David Cochran shows us a system that's ready to shift gears. Supriya Sharma has the enviable task of this pandemic. She delivers the good news. Today I'm here to talk to you about Health Canada's authorization of the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. Health Canada has approved not just AstraZeneca, but a second version of the same vaccine called Covishield. Made at the Serum Institute in India, the first 500,000 doses set to arrive next week. Vaccines will keep arriving faster and faster as we head into the spring. Like Moderna and Pfizer, these are two-dose vaccines, but unlike Moderna and Pfizer, they can be stored in a normal fridge, allowing vaccination programs to expand as supply ramps up. I think it's the best news we've heard in uh, a real long time. Well, that's great news. The federal government says they have some coming in uh, in uh, the next little period, and that's excellent news as well. With more than 20 million doses of AstraZeneca on order, this is a significant jolt to Canada's vaccine supply, and another may be coming. The single-dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine has moved to the final stage of approval in the United States. Canada expects to make its own decision within a month, meaning a bleak winter of low supply could become a spring of steady doses possibly could accelerate sort of our, our targets and our goals. Um, but of course, we've seen that there can be bumps in the road. If the bumps in the road aren't too severe, Canada is on track to vaccinate 16 million people by Canada Day, with the potential to do even more as other vaccines get approved. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. A newly approved vaccine means new questions such as how well does it work and who should get it. Vicodopia breaks down what we know about the AstraZeneca shot. In South Korea, the first shots of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine went into arms today. But as in other outlier countries like France, not in anyone over 65, because the supporting clinical trials didn't include enough seniors. So Health Canada had to ask the question. Would the benefits uh, of getting the vaccine versus not getting the vaccine, would the, could the benefits outweigh the risk? And the answer to that was yes. At the start of the pandemic, Oxford AstraZeneca was considered the front-runner vaccine. Unlike Pfizer and Moderna, it uses a modified virus to trigger an immune response. But problems with its clinical trials created delays, leading to questions about dosing and how effective it is, especially in seniors. I have no doubt whatsoever that this will work perfectly well in older people, and I think most people with any experience in, in uh, vaccine science would say the same thing. Indeed, in about 50 countries, the vaccine has already gone into millions of arms, many of those elderly. And the vaccine's 62% effectiveness in clinical trials is turning out to be higher in real-world use. Still, in a controversial move, South Africa suspended its rollout because of the new variant that emerged there. Preliminary results show the vaccine wasn't very effective at stopping people from getting mild or moderate symptoms, but that may not be the best measure of success. The best outcome uh, it will be to prevent serious complications from the infection. So that's why if a vaccine can do that, I think it's, it's fulfilling its main, uh, main purpose. 
AstraZeneca is already working on reformulating its vaccine to address variants, but that'll likely be in later booster shots, so that shouldn't slow down the vaccine's rollout. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Let's bring in one of the people who is part of that approval process, Health Canada's Chief Medical Advisor, Dr. Supriya Sharma. And Dr. Sharma, there's reporting tonight that the United States is about to approve a fourth vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson one. What's the timeline for that in Canada? So the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is under review. We just received some final information today. So if all goes well and there's no issues with that information, we can expect to see a decision potentially in the next couple of weeks. And for now, of course, we have three vaccines approved here. Should Canadians be able to, to choose which one they get? So, you know, if a vaccine is authorized by Health Canada, it means that it has met standards for safety, efficacy and quality. Overall, the benefits outweigh the risks and that it works in those areas that we really need it to. So preventing very severe COVID-19, preventing deaths from COVID-19. So there are no good and bad vaccines. So I would say to Canadians, when it's your turn and it's your time to get vaccinated, that, you know, you roll up your sleeves and that you take the vaccine that's, that's offered to you. And that'll help all of us bring down the COVID-19 numbers across Canada, which is the most important thing that we're trying to do. Dr. Sharma, thank you very much. Thank you. The head of Canada's largest pension plan has resigned after it was revealed he received a COVID-19 vaccine while on a trip to the United Arab Emirates. Mark Machin had been president and CEO of the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board since 2016. His resignation comes after Machen told staff in an email that he was in Dubai with his partner for what he called, quote, a very personal trip. A U.S. intelligence report is out on the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. It points the finger at Saudi Arabian Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman as the one who approved the operation. As Stephen D'Souza tells us, the Biden administration is trying to set a new tone between the two countries. Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi was last seen entering the Saudi embassy in Istanbul in 2018. Today, the Biden administration released a four-page report confirming what many believed about his death. We assess that Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman approved an operation in Istanbul, Turkey to capture or kill Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. This practice, this conduct, whether it's by Saudi Arabia or anyone else, is totally unacceptable. Khashoggi was a prominent voice for reform in Saudi Arabia who wrote for the Washington Post. His friends hope the report, long withheld by the Trump administration, will spark action. It's just the beginning. It's the first step uh, for the accountability. After the report's release today, the Biden team sanctioned a former Saudi intelligence chief and banned 76 Saudi nationals, bringing in new restrictions for anyone working for a foreign government to silence dissidents abroad. We were going to, in fact, make them pay the price. Despite promises of tough action and a departure from the cozy relationship between the prince and the Trump administration, activists questioned why bin Salman, known as MBS, wasn't himself sanctioned today. MBS should not be an exception to the rule of law. He's, he should, he, he's part of the team. He should be sanctioned. Uh, he should be not allowed to uh, travel. The State Department defended the decision, saying the relationship with the complicated Middle East ally is bigger than one person. What we've done by the actions that we've taken uh, is really not to rupture the relationship, but to recalibrate it, to be more in line with our interests uh, and our values. Friends of Khashoggi say no matter what happens next, his mission to speak freely and seek democratic reforms in Saudi Arabia should not be forgotten. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Secretary of State Blinken also continued virtual meetings between the United States and Canada today, taking the opportunity to echo President Biden's position on the fate of two Canadian citizens detained in China. We stand in absolute solidarity uh, with Canada uh, in insisting on their immediate and unconditional release. Blinken stressed the U.S. will work with Ottawa to secure the release of the two Michaels, Favor and Coverig, who have been detained since 2018, shortly after Canada arrested Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou. Cindy Gladieu was killed in an Edmonton hotel room almost 10 years ago. The man responsible was convicted just last week. Gladieu's family may finally have found justice, but now they're searching for something else, a proper burial. 
Jorge Barrera shows us how Gladio's treatment by the courts has made a simple request painfully complicated. It took 10 years and two trials to reach last week's manslaughter guilty verdict against the killer of Cindy Gladue. Now her family wants to gather her remains so she can finally rest whole. We haven't been able to lay her to rest because she's still sitting somewhere. In a case full of graphic, shocking details, one marked it with infamy. Gladue's pelvis was brought into the court during the 2015 trial of her killer that led to acquittal. The first time in Canadian legal history, preserved human tissue was displayed as evidence. The family was put in a very, very horrific situation of having to make a decision about whether or not they would um, allow this. The Crown's use of the body part as evidence of physical trauma sparked outrage. She was objectified and dehumanized, called a specimen, called tissue, called an object. The most glaring example in a trial that many saw dehumanize Gladue through stereotypes, repeated references to her as a native lady, sex worker. Nobody should ever have to make that type of decision um, because it should never have been asked. Gladue's family has been trying to repatriate her remains, approaching the Crown who handled the second trial for help. The Crown does not have control over um, Ms. Gladue's remains. Those, that's something that's in control of the medical examiner's office. Last week, Gladue's family contacted the office asking for the return of the remains so they could lay her to rest. This afternoon, shortly after CBC published stories citing that request, the office called the family asking for a meeting next week. This is just still open, you know. Um, we haven't even been able to really heal. A long wait for justice for the family, now a wait to say goodbye. Jorge Barrera, CBC News, Edmonton. Two Vancouver police officers are under investigation after they were spotted posing for photos beside a dead body. And a warning, you may find this video disturbing. A passerby took the video in Stanley Park earlier this week. The two officers can be seen snapping photos in front of a body lying on the shore. Vancouver Police say the Office of the Police Complaint Commissioner is now investigating. The man's death is not considered suspicious. It is massive, expensive and controversial and today the B.C. government said it will not cancel the Site C Dam project despite revealing the cost has ballooned by 60%. Tanya Fletcher looks at how the dam has become so divisive. Construction moves along at a cost of a few million dollars per day at the biggest infrastructure project in B.C. history. The Site C Dam is nestled in the northeastern corner of B.C., out of sight, perhaps, but certainly not out of mind. It's long been mired in controversy, the protests going back several years. After it broke ground in 2015, then-Premier Christy Clark vowed to push the project past the point of no return. I'm proud of what we're doing with Site C. I know we have a very different position on that from the opposition. John Horgan happened to be in opposition at the time when this now infamous photo was snapped. Fast forward to 2017, now Premier, he begrudgingly gave it the green light to continue. But this past summer, foundational problems surfaced. It was unclear if they could be fixed and at what cost. The political calls mounted to cancel the project altogether. Instead, an independent review was done and the report's findings kept secret until today. They confirmed that the project can proceed safely and will be built to the highest dam standards. The price tag, though, has shot up more than 60 percent, but the Premier maintains the alternative was worse. Cancelling Site C when it was half done would have meant laying off 4,500 workers. It would have left us with a $10 billion debt and nothing to show for it. Not enough to silence critics in the legislature. An astonishingly terrible business case. Nor opponents living near the site, including a First Nation that's taking the project to court. And from the very beginning of this whole process, we stated that we weren't opposed to the creation of the energy. What we're opposed to is the destruction of the valley. Yet construction will continue full steam ahead until completion in 2025, a year behind schedule and way over budget. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver.
Health officials in Alberta confirmed two more deaths have been linked to a COVID-19 outbreak at a meatpacking plant. In total, three deaths have now been linked to the Olimel facility in Red Deer. The plant temporarily shutting down production last week because of the growing outbreak. Some 500 cases have been connected to the facility, with 156 still considered active. There were no new deaths from COVID-19 reported in Ontario's long-term care homes today. That's something we have rarely been able to say during this pandemic. A commission has been examining Ontario's hard-hit homes and the province's response. And tonight, some details of what Ontario's Deputy Premier and Health Minister told the commission, painting the picture of failures in the lead-up to the pandemic and the panic when it hit. David Common has been looking at the just-released transcripts. David, a lot of detail. What are some of the keys? One thing that's absolutely clear, Ian, is that there was no complete pandemic plan leading up to COVID in spite of multiple warnings from the WHO and others to multiple governments over many years. They said get a plan and yet there still wasn't a plan. The other thing there wasn't? Enough PPE. 90% of Ontario's emergency stockpile actually got destroyed in the months leading up to the pandemic because it was expiring and yet nobody thought to replenish it. No money went in to do that. And the consequence was when COVID hit, there wasn't enough for staff in long-term care. They worried about their lives. They left, care suffered. Another key thing we heard from Christine Elliott's deputy minister that in hindsight, they wish they got the military in a little bit sooner to those hard hit homes. So many witnesses saying it took too long to get vaccines into the care homes. How did the minister respond to that? Christian Elliott rejecting that, saying they got it in as quickly as they could. But by contrast to Quebec, which actually took deliveries in long-term care homes, Ontario put them into hospitals. That made it harder to get it into the arms of the seniors, the people living in long-term care, and really created this difference between those two provinces. Thanks, David. A Toronto nanny faced a frightening scenario this week. A stroller, a careening car, and a split-second decision. Jillian Mendoza reportedly risked her safety to save the children in her care, and now she's the one who could use some help. And as Magda Gebersalasa shows us, thousands of people are stepping up. She's been called a hero nanny. Now Jillian Mendoza's family is praying for her quick recovery from far away. Although she's in a lot of pain, she wanted us to know that she's doing good. She's a fighter, really. The Toronto nanny was pushing two children in a stroller when she was struck by this vehicle that jumped the curb Wednesday. Mendoza is reported to have shoved the stroller out of the way. Police say the children had minor scratches and bumps. However, Mendoza, who was pinned between the car and the wall, had to be taken to a trauma centre. She's had several operations, but was able to speak to her loved ones on the phone, including her daughter, who lives in the Philippines. Her daughter already know what happened to her, but she doesn't know the um, gravity of uh, her situation. I just saw the young woman. Dr. Gary Klein's dental office is just steps away from where the accident took place. He rushed over to help and stopped the bleeding. I was just trying to reassure her that... Uh, help is on the way. We wish her a speedy recovery and it's just so unfortunate how things were. While she recovers, help keeps coming. A GoFundMe account set up by a friend has raised more than $100,000. The friend behind the account says Mendoza financially supports her family from a distance. She's so thankful to everyone that's been uh, helping her regarding her uh, GoFundMe page and for mm -hmm. the love and support. Police say the investigation into the cause of the crash is ongoing. Mark de Gebrasselasse, CBC News, Toronto. A rare television appearance tonight by Prince Harry. You know us rules, we don't carry cash. Next on The National, why he's being accused of upstaging the Queen. The feeling over here is that Harry and Meghan can sometimes be a bit tone deaf. With another vaccine approved in Canada, the doctors answer your questions. Does this mean that millions of Canadians will be vaccinated with a less effective vaccine? What are the differences between the three vaccines approved in Canada? In particular, will younger age groups have access to a vaccine more quickly? And Lady Gaga's dogs stolen. The violent robbery caught on video. Obviously, the perpetrators knew they came armed and prepared. 
Are thieves trying to cash in on the demand for pandemic puppies? We're back in two. We all know what the British press can be like, and it was destroying my mental health. I was really? like, this is toxic. Yeah. So I did what any husband and what any father would do is like, I need to get my family out of here. That is Prince Harry opening up to comedian James Corden about leaving London and moving to Los Angeles. He said it was about stepping back rather than stepping down. All summer, finding the interview refreshingly candid, others say Harry and Meghan's timing is just off. And as Margaret Evans tells us, they're being accused of stealing the royal thunder. There's Hollywood royalty, albeit imported in the form of James Corden, and then there's real royalty. Just pay the fare and hop on up, okay? You know us royals, we don't carry cash. And this is what it looks like when they mix. New Californian Prince Harry getting his own tour of Los Angeles, courtesy of the talk show host. See him there? That's David Schwimmer's house. Royal watchers say it was a delight to see the old Harry back, mischievous, lighthearted, and sending himself up. I certainly watched it and thought, well, you know, this really does knock all those suggestions that Harry is unhappy on the head. Oh, this is a story all about how... Matt but it's the timing of the release that has critics accusing him of upstaging his grandmother, the Queen, just as she made a rare appearance urging people back home to get vaccinated for the collective good. It is obviously difficult for people to, if they've never had a vaccine, because they ought to think about other people rather than themselves. Hey, Megan. The Corden interview was recorded before last week's announcement that Harry and his wife, Meghan Markle, will not return to the UK as working royals and before his 99-year-old grandfather, Prince Philip, was admitted to hospital with an infection where he still remains. We've seen them a few times. They've seen Archie running around. But my, my grandfather, instead of, like, pressing leave, meeting yes he just goes <laughs> but it also comes ahead of another celebrity interview soon to be released this time by oprah winfrey like corden a guest at harry and megan's wedding the feeling over here is that um harry and megan can sometimes be a bit tone deaf and and in that i think people mean they're not really paying much attention to everything else that's going on in the world Adding to that feeling of dueling royals, the Winfrey interview will air on the same day the Queen delivers her annual message to the Commonwealth. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. After largely going unscathed, the Toronto Raptors were hit hard tonight by the NBA's COVID-19 protocols. Because of health and safety protocols, Pascal Siakam will not play this evening. Along with one of their star players, head coach Nick Nurse and five other members of his coaching staff were forced to miss tonight's game. Not clear how long they'll be sidelined. The team hasn't had a game postponed this season and no player or coach had missed a game due to COVID-19 before tonight. Next, your questions about the latest vaccine approved in Canada. Does this mean that millions of Canadians will be vaccinated with a less effective vaccine? We'll ask the doctors right after the break. And later, Lady Gaga speaks out after her dogs were stolen at gunpoint. We'll look at why dog snatching could be on the rise. With the vaccine now approved in Canada, our first shipment of half a million of these doses will arrive within weeks. Health Canada's approval of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is coming at a crucial time as provinces and territories are ramping up vaccinations in the community. Now that there are three vaccines approved and likely more to come, the Prime Minister maintains that any Canadian who wants a vaccine will be able to get one by September. But until then, there are still the variants of concern and questions about how significant the approval is of the AstraZeneca vaccine now. I'm joined by infectious disease specialist Dr. Susie Hoda and Dr. Zane Chaglin. We got lots of questions today about how effective the AstraZeneca vaccine is, and, and let's start by playing one of those. The AstraZeneca vaccine has an efficacy rate of about 62% or so, um, while Moderna and Pfizer's has an efficacy rate of over 90%. So it's safe to say um, AstraZeneca's is less effective. Does this mean that millions of Canadians will be vaccinated with a less effective vaccine? And uh, what are the implications of this? 
Dr. Chagwell, I'll put that question to you. Yeah, so there's a couple of things there. One, that 62% efficacy for the AstraZeneca vaccine was based on a clinical trial that was done um, in the UK, South Africa, and Brazil. Now, it's important to know the context. That was done at a time when COVID rates were actually increasing quite a bit throughout the fall and, and winter, whereas the Moderna and Pfizer data was actually done during the summertime where we saw COVID rates relatively lower. So the number may not be a complete match to compare apples to apples there. Add to that, you know, the people in the AstraZeneca trial, none of them ended up in hospital with COVID-19. And none of them ended up dying of COVID-19 after receiving the vaccine. And I think that's the most powerful part of this vaccine. Add thirdly that this is a vaccine that can be taken in, you know, essentially any location in fridges. It can be stored very easily. And so that portability, that ability to transport, that ability to expand its use actually means huge things. So, so this is a good vaccine. It may not be as perfect as Moderna and Pfizer, but for its purpose in the middle of a pandemic to prevent people from going to hospital and dying, it is an essential vaccine moving forward. You sound, I mean, is this a fair word? You sound excited. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we have a vaccine rollout that, that really needs supply, and this gives us more supply and more places to use it. We heard earlier in the show that South Korea and France are two countries that have restricted use of the AstraZeneca vaccine to people 65 and younger because they felt clinical trials didn't include enough seniors. Uh, Dr. Hoda, does it concern you that Health Canada has approved the use of this vaccine here in Canada for seniors 65 and older? So it's true that some countries have decided to not use this vaccine in people who are over the age of 65. However, I think it's really important to note that this is not because there's any evidence that it doesn't work in that age group or that it's not safe in that age group. It's purely because they didn't have enough people involved in the trials to know exactly how well it worked. So let's look at the other data that we have around the, the, the vaccine. Um, and some of the earlier studies did show that the immune response as measured in the blood of those who got the vaccine was uniform across different age groups. And now we're seeing some early data coming out of Scotland that's showing that across all age groups, including quite a few people involved who are uh, older in age, that even one dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine has reduced the risk of hospitalization in the cohort. Um, so we're starting to see some real benefits here. And I think it's important to balance our our, our desire to have more information um, with the absolute need to try and reduce the harms to older people who are, are disproportionately affected by this pandemic. So I, I think that it's a good thing that we've approved it for all age groups. I think we have time for one more video question. Let's uh, listen to that right now. I would like to know what are the differences between the three vaccines approved in Canada and will we have an option to choose one of the vaccines? So I'll ask each of you part of that question. First of all, Dr. Chagla, in about 45 seconds, what, what's a key difference uh, between these, these vaccines? So Pfizer and Moderna are mRNA vaccines. So they use mRNA to build the instructions to make spike protein, which causes the immune response. AstraZeneca is slightly different that it uses a virus that's not functional, that's harmless, to actually do the same thing, build the spike protein and set off the immune response. So that's the major difference in how these vaccines work. And Dr. Hoda, should people be able to pick between the vaccines? Well, I suspect we won't have the ability to do that, especially in the early stages of rolling it out. It's going to be about what's available. And as uh, Dr. Shagla had mentioned earlier, one of the benefits of this vaccine is it's easy to transport around because it doesn't require a freezer. So, you know, some locations that are more remote or more community-based will, will likely be the, the first targets. We have about 20 seconds left, Dr. Hodeb. I'll ask the same question to you that I did of Dr. Chagla. Are you excited, optimistic? What's your reaction to now that we have three vaccines approved? I'm feeling very optimistic between increasing supplies of Pfizer as well as um, seeing another vaccine approved and the options opening up. You know, the more vaccine we can get out there, the quicker we can do it, the better. Dr. Hoda, Dr. Chagla, always great having you on the program. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having me. We always want to hear your questions. You can message us directly on Instagram at CBC The National, or you can send us an email at covid at cbc.ca. As one of Canada's first geriatricians, Dr. Ronald Bain was ahead of his time, fighting for better senior care, pushing for access to medically assisted death. 
Today, facing his own terminal diagnosis, Bain chose to die on his own terms. But right to the end, his advocacy continued. Greg Rasmussen spoke with him in his final hours. At the age of 98, every step for Dr. Ronald Bain had become an excruciating effort. Hey, Dad. Is this well, let me give you a hand. Yeah. Okay. Hours away from his own physician-assisted death, he was still speaking out on how best to face terminal illness. Why I was very much in favor of medical-assisted death, and I said, that's certainly what I shall do. I shall not go into long-term care. You would choose death over long-term care? Is that essentially? Oh, yes, yes, exactly. He began practicing medicine in the 1940s, becoming one of Canada's first geriatricians, fighting a system he said neglected the elderly. To waste money on these old people who are going to die anyway, it's politically it's not very attractive, you know. There we go. <clears throat> he said while care has improved, the pandemic has revealed serious faults in long-term care. And COVID came along and revealed exactly what I'd been saying all these years. And of course, then the politicians are wringing their hands. Oh, we didn't know anything about it, never heard. Oh, we, if we'd only known we would have done. And they knew perfectly well, and they never did because it costs money. Facing terminal cancer and other ailments, he arranged a doctor to help him end his life in his home today. Thank God this is going to end. I'm not going to have to go through this every day. It's aching of bones and crunching of my back as I sit up. He described it as an empowering decision made alongside family, including daughter Lillian Bain. Time with you is very, very precious to us, you know. A health policy professor. I mean, you're sitting here talking to us and you're still so vital. And we just want to pull all of those gifts of love and generosity out of you. And we just want to keep having that. So it's it's really hard. That's the dilemma. On the one hand, we want to keep you with us because we love you so much and we know you love us and we continue to grow and learn from you all the time, every day. What's it like hearing that from Lillian? No, I can appreciate that, but of course, I'm going to die anyway, you know. It's not as if we're talking about cutting out 20 years of my life. To him, an assisted death simply made sense. Delighted. I'm looking forward to it. Just hours later, Dr. Bain went ahead with his plan, leaving behind a powerful call to do more for Canada's seniors. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Victoria. So much about that story is extraordinary, including, of course, their willingness to share it. And the issue of medical assistance in dying is being debated urgently in Ottawa. The government wants to expand eligibility to those suffering solely from mental illness. Parliament is up against a court order deadline now extended to the end of next month. Ahead on the national, the violent robbery that has Lady Gaga offering a half million dollar reward. But first. I was like, okay, well, people are really, really enjoying the cool ways that we're indigenizing trends. And so I kept going with it. Indigenous creators help adapt to tradition for the pandemic. This time of year, many indigenous communities hold round dances. Not only does it unite communities in friendship, it's an opportunity to grieve those who have passed. COVID-19 has changed the tradition, but hasn't stopped it. We caught up with the organizers of a virtual round dance in Ottawa. A round dance is a celebration ceremony, but at the end of the day, it's really about being around people and eating good food, having good laughs. So I'm just checking to make sure that the tree that I choose is very green and I see it right there. Ah, that's the one. <laughs> My name is Justine and I'll be cooking for the round dance. What? <laughs> I'm gonna be making a cedar tea with berries I'll be harvesting the cedar myself. Before COVID, I felt like I was really, really busy student mom life. And then COVID hit and it just got me back outside, back on the land and things that I always used to do with my grandmother. The 
the songs that I'll be singing uh, are basically uh, a, a grieving song, which is the intentions of this round dance is to grieve uh, the loss from this pandemic. Uh, but also, we have to maintain that balance. So I'll be singing a, a happy song uh, to, to keep that balance in there. Buju, Ani, Danse, hello. My name is Thielen Kiknaswe, and I'll be singing the round dance this year, and I'm looking forward to it. Every day is a good day when you're by my side. I believe the round dance is super important during COVID because not only have we been away from our friends and our family for almost over a year, but we've we've also been missing being with each other in, in our cultural ways that we that we used to do. We'll have some throat singing from Inuit youth. We also have some contests going on. Best round dance style, best hunter call. Hi, my name is Gabrielle Fayant, and I'm one of the committee members as well as the co-host for the A7G Virtual Round Dance. It's really a time to gather during the winter season. There's a lot of ceremony that is involved in it. There's a lot of emotions that are involved in it, but we also gather um, to socialize and spend time with each other. And I, I just think at the end of the day, it's gonna be able to create joy and hope for people. Hey everyone, welcome to the A7G Round Dance. Let us know where you guys are tuning in from. And it's so beautiful that people are all around the globe, all around North America coming together. The reason why we throat sing is because back in residential school times, throat singing was banned. And now we're proud to be bringing back our culture. We are Inuit and proud. <laughs> Well, right now we're gonna head on over to um, our live cooking show. Hi, thank you for including me in this. I'm very honored to have you all in my kitchen. If you don't, I will be making out. blueberry bannock and cedar berry iced tea. Your hands will get sticky. Don't worry about it. That's just what happens when you make bannock, regardless if you do my lazy way or you know my grandma's way. So bannock is not something that is traditional to our people. However, it is something that's very, very important because it does show our resiliency. It does show that even after all these years and you know our resources being taken and, and we managed to take it, make it our own. And this round dance is another example of that. We're not able to be together, but we've adapted through social media, through technology. This was so much fun. Find me on Facebook and justine.cooks on Instagram. Be wet. It's super great that we have so many different content creators who are Indigenous now sharing their videos and sharing what they're really passionate about. I started doing some videos in my regalia and doing trends in my regalia on TikTok. And I remember my first video, I did like a transition video. And that video got like, I think three quarters of a million views. I was like, okay, well, people are really, really enjoying the cool ways that we're indigenizing trends. And so I kept going with it. To indigenous people, our hair is everything. I posted a video about the significance of long hair to indigenous people. And that video has, um, you know, got over 5 million views. I wear these braids to show people that I'm proud of who I am. The intentions that we're putting up these videos are with to have other people learn, hopefully something, even just a little something about who we are as native and indigenous people. This round dance will be a really great memory of how we were able to get through this really tough time. Now we're going to uh, head on over to Fishing Lake. I want to thank you all for tuning in to the results on a recent journey looking for the best hunting call. And so just reminding people like we're going to get through this and there'll be a time where uh, we can all come together again. Coming up, the latest on a strange story of assault, abduction, and a massive reward. The latest on pop superstar Lady Gaga's stolen dogs and the weird world of pet theft. Next.
I'm Jamie Poisson. Join me for CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner. Every weekday, Front Burner takes you deep into the story shaping Canada and the world. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. We have some good news late tonight for Lady Gaga. Her two dogs that were stolen earlier this week have been returned unharmed. Police in Los Angeles say a woman brought them into a station. They say it doesn't seem that she was associated with the attack. Earlier, Gaga announced a huge reward for the two French Bulldogs after a man shot her dog walker, Ryan Fisher, in the chest and snatched the pets. On Twitter today, the singer praised Fisher, who doctors say will be okay, called him a hero who risked his own life. Thomas Dagla looks into this bizarre story and whether dog snatching is on the rise. It's the danger that's dogging more pet owners these days. But it's something I think about and I'm just really cautious about it. With the theft of a pop star's pooches now the talk of dog parks everywhere. That's just inhumane and why would you do that to somebody? And why would you do that to the dog? Lady Gaga has never hidden her French bulldogs from her fans and it seems they caught the eye of criminals too. That's Gaga's dog walker out with her pets Wednesday night in Hollywood. Watch as that car pulls up. Two men jump out and attack, making off with two bulldogs. The dog walker, Ryan Fisher, left behind with gunshot wounds, though he is expected to fully recover. I'm sure that this dog walker probably does this every day at the same time. Obviously, the perpetrators knew they came armed and prepared. Gaga offered half a million dollars to get her dogs back highlighting the lucrative potential for criminals. With more families at home during the pandemic welcoming puppies, there's an increased demand for pooches, meaning some thieves are trying to cash in. Some stolen pets are resold using classified ads or even social media. It's called dog flipping. Here in Canada, there's little police data showing a rise in reported dog nappings, but just check out this Facebook page for lost and found pets in Ontario. When asked about stolen dogs, an administrator said, we absolutely have seen an increase. Though it's nothing new for this pet retrieval specialist. If their, their pets run away, somebody gets them and now they want, well, ransom almost to get them back. And you would never put the money up front, ever. It's sort of be an exchange. I mean, if it was a stolen dog, I would, I would be phoning the police. A scary prospect for pet lovers at a time when furry friends are in high demand. Thomas Dagle, CBC News, Toronto. Next on the National, a children's book is a way to combat racism. How an Ontario woman is retelling African folklore. Next, in our moment. Entrepreneurs, are you ready to take your business to the next level? <laughs> That's the kind of entrepreneur I want to work with. You hit it out of the park. A deal with the dragons could change your life. Woo, we did it. Stop dreaming, start pitching. We got a deal. Get online to apply now. Annette Pateman has found a creative way to do anti-racism work by writing a children's story based on African and Caribbean folklore. She remembers hearing the stories as a child growing up in Jamaica, so she put her spin on it, hoping to get kids curious about different cultures. And tonight... It's our moment. This is my first children's book. The book is called Anansi and the Turtle. And Anansi is um, an, a West African folktale character. And he's a spider. And that's Anansi is the Ghanaian word for spider. The stories were brought over um, by the enslaved Africans. Um, they generally all passed on orally. Um, so through, people will sit around the fire and swap stories about Anansi and his adventures. My father was a great oral storyteller. It seemed he always had a, a Nazi story um, up his uh, sleeve. I wanted to write the Nazi stories because my father passed away in 2015. I just thought it'd be lovely to record some of what he told me. Anything really that brings people awareness of another culture and increases that awareness and maybe that curiosity is probably a good thing. So I think there are lots of different ways that you can um, do anti-racism work, but one way is through storytelling. I think it's a great way of um, doing anti-racism work. 
There's so much to like about that story. Not only, of course, unlocking those folklore tales, but also, hopefully, there's so many other cultures, not just in different parts of the world, but even, for example, different parts of Canada. I bet you there are lots of children's fables that uh, are told orally and, and have never been put down in a book. So hopefully that will begin to change. That is the National for February the 26th. I hope you can join me on Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio 1 Live. It starts at 4 Eastern, 1 Pacific. We'll be talking about calls to boycott the Beijing Winter Olympic Games next year. And then later Sunday evening, I'll be back here for the National. Good night.